The Human Experience, Inside the Humanities at Stanford University, humanexperience.stanford.edu. One of the most uh, enriching aspects of teaching in IHUM for me was the encouragement to reflect on our practice. And that, that's not something that I have really found elsewhere. Um, I taught in a Cal State institution at, at Stanislaus for a couple of years, which was teaching, the emphasis was on teaching, but only in sort of a quantitative bulk way in a sense. We were expected to teach a lot. Whereas at, Stan <laughs> at Stanford, we were expected to teach well. And conditions were provided within which we could do that. We could develop. We had the leisure to practice and the encouragement to try out new things and a support system that would, uh, we could throw ideas around, kick ideas around, beat up ideas, I guess, and uh, talk about things. And that has really stuck, stuck with me since. Um, I work interdisciplinarily. I wrote a book on Heidegger and sculpture. I've taught a graduate course on Wagner and philosophy, and I'm not an expert in any of these fields. Um, so I was led to reflect, uh, what exactly am I doing? And uh, <laughs> this is the result of, of that. It's called, uh, There is No Interdisciplinarity. Uh, it's a number of short sections. Uh, number one is entitled, A Naive Presupposition. One suppo supposes that there are distinct fields of inquiry that would each reign over a particular subject matter, group of objects, etc. Interdisciplinarity would be the application of one discipline's methods upon the subject matter of another. Philosophical interpretations of literature, the rhetorical study of science, the place of architecture in film. But the very idea that a discipline has control over a subject matter is suspect. Certainly, disciplines grow and expand to accommodate new materials, new ideas. They appropriate areas of inquiry once foreign to them. Philosophy becomes neuroscience, for instance. New disciplines emerge over time. One thinks of DeLillo's character in White Noise, who founded a department of Hitler studies. The old subject matter is updated or replaced. Think of the focus of contemporary rhetoric departments or departments of uh, comparative literature, where comparison is not necessarily the, the strength of the departments anymore. A discipline is a far from stable thing. And can there ever be a sharing of objects? Just one example, and this among contemporaries, the heart. The heart as known by William Harvey as circulator of blood, by Rene Descartes as seat of the passions, by Blaise Pascal as bequeathing us a logic beyond reason. Two, an easy assumption. Everyone knows interdisciplinarity is the new byword of the university, but it's a new word that's already grown old. It's just repeated meaninglessly like something learned by heart. The assumption is that a discipline can be enriched by an injection of new blood and that this would take place at the limits of a discipline. It's easy to think that disciplines have limits and that we researchers can stand at those limits and find ourselves exposed to the beyond, that this exposure presents the challenge of a discipline, decides its limits, that only those who have mastered their own discipline are grounded in it, only they can withstand this exposure to another, to this beyond, and not simply withstand it, but grow from it, incorporate it, and put it to use in the continuance of work that only through such encounters, such struggles, would truth show itself. This heroism of interdisciplinarity is suspect. It would seem to bolster the power of one discipline at the expense of another. It is a sneering interdisciplinarity that shows you what your own discipline is too stupid to understand. It proves to you the power of a discipline by pushing it to the breaking point. The proof of power and its equation with truth are the keys. Uh, in ancient Greece, the situation is transparently clear when one considers Socrates, the founder of philosophy. Socrates of, is the founder of philosophy despite the philosophers who came before him. Henceforth, they are all pre-Socratic. <laughs> this, <laughs> this kind of demarcation surrounds the activity of Socrates. Socrates was the disciplinarian par excellence. He never leaves the borders, will even die before transgressing the bounds of law. What was Socrates' whole endeavor directed at, if not the truth? For there are so many truths. Look at the corpus, the Protagoras, the Gorgias, Euthydemus, the Phaedrus, all against the sophists and rhetoricians. One could add Thrasymachus of the Republic and the Ion as well. 
such a large part of the work directed against his competitors. What are Socrates' at attacks against the sophists, the rich and well-respected Gorgias and Protagoras, for instance, if not efforts to secure a new niche for himself and for philosophy? Socrates is a disciplinarian, but he's not happy to simply make a name for himself and for philosophy alongside the rhetoricians, sophists, rhapsodes, tragedians, and poets. He has to subordinate them. There can only be one truth. The sophists must be humiliated, the poets excluded from the city. These are all so many moves against competitors, competitors who must be mastered. The question to be asked concerns the strength of the connection between disciplinary rigor, policing, exclusionary practices, purification, and the dream of one truth. Without a challenge to this one truth, there can be no interdisciplinarity. Socrates, as master of discipline, discipline as punishment. The wilderness. Another version, another vision of interdisciplinarity attempts to avoid all this with the thought that the researcher leaves the bounds of their home discipline in order to work between the disciplines. The work one does would not fit comfortably in any one discipline. It's philosophy, but also musicology, and perhaps not really either, strictly speaking. One would enter a new wilderness beyond the frontier, a place where the researcher can operate uninhibited by the parochial restrictions of the townsfolk. Here in the wilds, everything would be permitted. Here one would breathe more freely. The going would be rough, not for the faint-hearted. Life would be cheap, fatal mistakes frequent, but the rewards and the glory to be had. The discoverer of the unknown, following no established map or method, the cartographer's dream realized, mapping new objects, perhaps to even create a discipline of one's own, running through the wilds, avoiding the fortifications of the disciplines, eluding their guards, in the name of scholarship, perhaps even die Frohlische Wissenschaft, joyful wisdom, gay science. The whole notion is suspect. There is no wild. There is no space between the disciplines. They claim everything to themselves and always have. Nothing eludes their inquiry or inquisition. Their objects are made to testify to their power. There's no between and nothing free. One does not step outside so easily. In Faust, as I taught in Iham, Mephistopheles, <laughs> is questioned as to how he can be here on earth when he instead has been condemned to hell. He replies that wherever he is is hell. He brings it with him. And so too do we, our disciplines. <laughs> yeah. The open forum. The idea that there would be a space between the disciplines agrees with the optimism of the university for interdisciplinarity. There's not a wilderness beyond the law populated by outlaws and brigands. It's a space of rational congregation and debate, a forum for the interchange of ideas, a safe space. Between the disciplines, we enter an empty space where every voice can be heard, especially those that the various disciplines have silenced in their efforts to entrench themselves in the truth. The practitioners of the disciplines can come together here and exchange their ideas freely, help each other along, bring new perspectives to the work at hand. The more perspectives, the better, or maybe not, but certainly always more than one. The space between the disciplines is empty, democratic, unprejudiced, open. It will admit all who come. And then they'll talk. But the forum for the interdisciplinary exchange of ideas is not simply a space of talk. It is also one of principled action. For only interdisciplinary work, it is claimed in its favor, is able to truly assess and engage with the reality on the ground. Interdisciplinarity comes to stand as an antidote against the theoretical excesses of the disciplines left to their own devices their involuting monologue. Reality exceeds any particular discipline, and thus interdisciplinarity will give us our best purchase on reality. Interdisciplinarity is more practical as well as more rational. Interdisciplinarity allows us to rationally discuss ideas with a view towards principled action. Anyone who speaks of an interdisciplinary revolution has a corpse in their mouth. Uh, six, non-mastery. If we take up interdisciplinarity, do we not also lose something by gaining this? There is an assumption that only one firmly rooted within their own discipline, their home department, can effectively work interdisciplinarily. Only one who has mastered the history and traditions of their field can effectively bring this knowledge to bear on the foreign. But what if we forego the very idea of a crucible revealing truth, of contest and conflict as processes of refinement whereby the gold of truth eventually shines forth? 
What if interdisciplinarity really did involve uprooting oneself? What if only the uprooted could experience the swaying winds of interdisciplinarity? What if, simply put, interdisciplinarity means abandoning all claims to mastery? Who would dare act interdisciplinarily? The disciplines are arenas of mastery and control, rigor, depth, certainty, history, tradition, debate, assertion, insistence, publication, redaction, rebuttal, royalties, all these so many forms of mastery and domination. The warlord of a fiefdom who would cast out all contenders to power. Interdisciplinarity must abandon all claims to mastery. We can go one step further. It must welcome the dabblers, surrender itself to the charlatans, expect so many misfires and abortions, not blanch in the face of the methodless. It's unclear if the academy has the stomach for this. Uh, the last point, contra interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity happens within a discipline. Disciplines do not permeate in total saturation. The ground is never even, as the very earth attests. Dry spots remain. There is always seepage, leakage, oxidation. One never leaves a discipline for confrontation with another. This is a lie of the masters. One always ever succumbs from within. There's no interdisciplinarity if this means that there would be a space between or outside or among the disciplines that's ready for the conquering. Interdisciplinarity can only mean a de-disciplinification, <laughs> pardon the term, of the researcher. <laughs> one need not go outside, one simply stays within, but within is now shedding the trappings of mastery, like water gliding off a body freshly emerged from the water. Interdisciplinarity is not another field of inquiry, it's nothing demarcated, nothing fixed, but nothing we encounter without the risk, but perhaps it's better named to hope that what does not kill us will in no way make us stronger. Thank you. Are we all going to talk and then have a conversation? Or are we going to? Yeah, OK. <laughs> and now for something completely different. <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about, oh my god, this is so loud, about scaffolding interdisciplinarity. So this is pretty much in direct opposition to everything uh, Andrew just said, so we should have a great conversation later. Um, so the subtitle is The Lab Model of Collaborative Humanities Scholarship. And just for Ellen, I just added, or how I hum ruined me for the English department, because she thinks I have an identity crisis. Um, so my title, which will become relevant at Duke, is Assistant Research Professor of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies. And I'm the program director of Information Science and Information Studies, which is an interdisciplinary certificate program. So just a brief recap for those of you who don't know, I'm here um, in false clothing. I was actually at Stanford not as a teaching fellow, but as the academic technology specialist for IHUM. Um, I went on to be the manager of the ATS group and um, also taught in fall IHUM. So I wore this dual role um, as being a person who was helping to create the technological interventions and then also trying to eat my own dog food. So some of the courses that I was involved with are Bodies in Place, Investigating Selfhood and Location, Sex, Its Pleasures and Cultures, and The Human and the Machine, all fall I hum. So since then, I've been at Duke, um, where as I mentioned, my departmental home is in Art, Art, History, and Visual Studies. If you recall that I have a PhD in English, that may seem a little strange to you. Um, the English department uh, at first grudgingly gave me an appointment and then kind of changed their mind and they refused to uh, list any of my courses. Um, I'm also affiliated with any number of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs, initiatives, and labs. I mentioned information science and information studies. That's the program that I went to Duke to uh, help direct. Um, and then there's an array of others, the arts of the moving image, our new MFA in Experimental and Documentary Arts, the Visual Studies Initiative, which is a Mellon-funded cross-curriculum program, um, the Wired Lab for Digital Historical Visualization, and then a variety of Franklin Humanities Institute interdisciplinary labs. One is called the Haiti Lab, one is called Borderworks, and the one that I'm a co-director of is called Greater Than Games. Um, so these are all uh, different types of academic formations. There's permanent formations, you know, the departments, there's semi-permanent semi formations, you know, the certificate programs. Um, and then there's temporary formations, these labs that are intentionally of a limited duration. Now, for me, I think of myself, um, perhaps just to keep me, myself sane, of, as doing one thing over and over again in a lot of different contexts. So what is that? Um, and this, my little side note here was just sort of a joke, but I thought it was kind of funny. If you want to start an interdisciplinary program, the first thing you do is make up an acronym. The second thing you do is create a logo, and you're halfway there. 
but that'll come, I'll come back to that. So the way I think about what I'm actually doing at Duke, and I'm not sure if my various bosses would agree with this or not, um, is scaffolding collaborative interdisciplinary scholarship. Um, so I'm taking digital humanities approaches to questions and interests legible to home disciplines um, and making them visible to others, um, such as traditional, traditional archive development, text analysis, um, but also increasingly multimodal, data-driven types of approaches. Um, for myself, I'm especially interested in thinking about place, space, time, and genre as key multidisciplinary organizing principles that cut across the variety of, dis of uh, humanities disciplines that I work with, um, that they're useful for studying heterogeneous objects and phenomena in context and as mutually constituting systems and social actors. I'm probably not going to read everything because I was originally thinking I was going to have more time, but this is giving you an idea of the sort of intellectual framework that I use to come to the various projects that I'm involved with. And then additional categories of analysis come in as they relate to the disciplines that my collaborators are involved in. Um, I also work with people outside of the humanities, and I think that that's going to be increasingly important for all of us to think about doing, working in really engaged, committed ways with people who don't self-identify as humanists, but with whom we might find common cause around other questions. So um, what I hope to do is create interdisciplinary zones of inquiry developed through common projects, which constitute a temporary field implemented through what I'm calling a lab structure. Sometimes it's self-identified as a lab and sometimes it's just a useful term. In dialogue with disciplinary and institutional interests, so it's not like we're throwing away the disciplines, and then facilitated by new media forms and methods. So some of those include uh, the, con the central concept of media convergence for both exploration and presentation. Um, so thinking about multimedial and multimodal ways to approach content to, instead of thinking about um, one type of content be associated with one discipline, um, for instance, if you're in literature, then you basically pay attention to text. If you're in art, then you basically pay attention to images. Um, but instead of thinking about it that way, thinking about putting all these things in juxtaposition to each other, um, and going along with this is the concept of a database substrate of the various media objects rearranged according to whatever narrative lights, conceptual lights, argumentative lights we might bring to bear upon the subject. So this is really a, a hypermedia, new media way of thinking about authorship um, across disciplinary platforms with the idea that you or I might come to a set of materials and draw out some sort of genealogical description, some sort of synchrotic expression or diachronic expression of the materials with an argument associated with it that we have an environment, a scaffold, that enables us to do this and to weave our own disciplinary structures through something that is larger that we can all participate in. And the idea here is that it's, you have a common idea or project or concept that a lot of different people can choose to participate in, but that you have some sort of common center, some, com some, co ugh, some common question. And then the additional hope, which is also con controversial, is that having created such an infrastructure that you can template abstracted versions of that so that somebody else could take your infrastructure and apply it in a slightly different but related context. Now this all sounds very abstract, I know, and I'm going to talk to about a few examples now. So some of the projects that I have been working on for the last few years, uh, this is a very eclectic seeming list probably, multimedia mapping in Mahuru Bay, Kenya, the virtual crystal palace of 1851, Digital Durham 2.0, visualizing art, law, and markets. The 19th century Caribbean cholera project, visualizing Venice, the slave nations database, Cityville meets Kiva, which is a game project, and perhaps the most controversial of all, the virtual tent city project. So these projects uh, share what I was describing as a multimodal arrangement of objects that are used for a variety of purposes. The multimedia mapping project um, was primarily an intervention in a region where a nonprofit organization was creating a school for girls. And our group was trying to think about how to represent that space to itself and to each other, as well as to help NGOs who were helping to develop the community figure out where water sources um, were going to be placed. The Virtual Crystal Palace project is probably the closest to my academic background. It's an effort to try and do a multimodal thick description of um, an event or a phenomena in a specific time period. The idea and hope here is a sort of the thing that's always in the back of my mind, no matter what these other projects are, is that 
having done it once, that we can do it again, maybe starting out with other exhibitions, but also thinking about other complex cultural formations. Digital Durham 2.0 is a variation on this that's more focused on thinking about how historical materials can be bought, brought more visibly into the present, um, both for people in the community um, and for scholars who have access to these endless archives now being digitized, but yet don't have clear ways to remix or share them or present them. So this is a, a classroom-oriented project that I'll go into a bit more. Visualizing art law and markets is an experiment with our art history students to think about how new visualization tools can help them to understand the flows and networks of association amongst artists in Europe and dealers. And the 19th century Caribbean cholera project was a way of thinking about how to bring together quantitative and qualitative data about the incidences of cholera in the Caribbean and to determine that, in fact, there was no cholera before 2010 in Haiti, something that was not immediately visible without having done this deep dive into original historic materials. Um, incidentally, um, my collaborator on that, um, Deborah Jensen, and, and I are being published in the uh, CDC Journal for Emerging Infectious Diseases with this article. She is a Romance Studies scholar, and of course <laughs> I am whatever it is that I am. Um, and we also have our lab, the students who are involved in our lab involved in this publication. So about now you might be wondering, okay, fine, but what do I know about global health initiatives in Africa, the psychogeographies of built environments as they relate to female empowerment, the social, economic, and racial history of Durham, North Carolina, Flemish art markets, the spread of cholera in the 19th century, architecture of Venice, microfinance incentives, alternate reality game design, maybe you'll give me the Crystal Palace, nothing. But I taught fall I hum. <laughs> so what are the lessons in interdisciplinary collaboration I learned from fall I hum? One thing, uh, don't be afraid of the texts themselves. Just dig deep and learn from them. We're all smart people, we can do that. Immerse yourself. I gave myself any number of 101 quick studies, deep dives into the subject matter. I don't care if we were pretending that we were doing some sort of new critical, we're just going to approach the text itself and only study five texts. I needed context and history and the history of the criticism uh, to converse with each other. One of my favorite parts of the fall I hums was to see the faculty sitting on the stage arguing with each other about something. I think that kind of real productive exchange, you know, where they really were disagreeing, not just staging positions, um, is the kind of thing that enlivens the debate. And you can extend that, of course, to uh, with a colleague across the table, across the quad. Another important thing that came out of working in Fall IHUM was thinking about how to articulate your own strength and your own position. This is something that we've talked about in terms of pedagogy, but it's also true in terms of the critical apparatus that we bring to bear. Um, another way of thinking about that is how you define your terms. We often talked in my classes about learn to think like an X, you know, whether that was um, a philosopher or an historian or uh, you know, a religious studies scholar. Uh, what your collaborator may mean by paradigm, model, visualize, argue, prove, method, ontology, truth, theory, practice, culture, all of those terms are extremely loaded and they may be self-evidently obvious to you coming out of your own disciplinary background and yet they can mean something so different that people can mentally come to blows over it. And also, understand what the real project is to you and what the real project is to your collaborators. If you're working in this kind of environment that I'm describing, I can think that what we're really doing is thinking about um, cultural exchange and, um, and uh, representation of empire in the Victorian era, but somebody that I'm working with from engineering can think, we're really trying to figure out how to reduce the number of vertices in this model so that we can render it in a game engine. These are both equally valid, useful, interesting goals, but they're distinct goals. So you don't have to have everybody agree all the time, but I think that the critically important moment is to have so have the project be important to each individual person in their own way. And that that's what's going to really encourage longevity of the project. And value and work, the infrastructure that you have available to you. Um, I would suggest that we all go back as much as we're able to and test out your collaboration ideas through teaching as we did in IHUM. Um, maybe develop a conceptual collaborative space or lab of your own. It doesn't have to be something as fancy as our Franklin Humanities Institute labs, which I'm fortunate enough to be involved with through our wealthy institution and Mellon funding, but you can create your own lab, you know, make a little sign and put it out there. Um, it's, it's possible, you know, it's creating the conceptual space for yourself 
to feel free to explore a little bit outside the boundaries. The other thing that we talk a lot about in uh, My Neck of the Woods is that proximity matters. The physical location does matter if you have ways of being adjacent to each other, that that can be to lead to the side conversations that work something. This is really a variation on the idea that teaching together can lead to research collaborations. Another one of our Duke buzzwords is vertical integration. Well, what that really means is that you can start out something small, perhaps at the lowest undergraduate level, and then eventually have it evolve into something uh, that's much more advanced. Um, the uh, cholera project, for example, started out in a class that Deborah and I were co-teaching called Representing Haiti, where, as we like to say, or I did anyway, um, she knew the part about Haiti and I knew the part about representing, and so between the two of us, somehow we were going <laughs> to work it out. Um, and then the CDC contacted her because of an opinion piece she wrote in the New York Times, and then we, or in, sorry, well, somewhere else, not the New York Times. Um, and then it all just sort of snowballed into something that resulted in this unexpected publication. Relating to that, um, think about new publication models as you're starting to explore these, this project-based work and public ba publication-based models that do have lower barriers of entry initially. So take seriously the idea that you can web publish and then you can have something in a peer-reviewed environment and then maybe have the, the ultimate goal of a print publication, but, or maybe not, but to open up the possibilities for multimodal expression of even what you're working on. One of the things we've been talking a lot about a lot with the Venice Project, the Visualizing Venice Project, is that we want to have a view that's the, the sort of public humanities view of the content, um, but also be able to drill down to the scholarly view if you want to. So opening up our scholarship, not making the dummy view for the universe and then the smart view for the scholars, but finding ways to make it so that you can drill down deeper if you want to, but you don't get lost in the details. It's a different way of thinking about how to author, because this is getting back to the database model that I was describing. You know, you have this array of materials available to you and then different views or representations atop that. Of course, uh, I mentioned the templates and models. Also think about developing a technology infrastructure that allows you to continue forward. I have to say that, given my background. Um, and thinking about that both in terms of communications technologies, but also the database systems, servers, storage, high-performance computing, all the things that make it possible to actually move forward with the types of interdisciplinary, new media enhanced projects that I've been describing. And then of course, uh, explore the structural and individual staff partnerships that can help make this all seem practical. And this includes things like being able to cite librarians on your grant proposals, which I've been having a lot of trouble with. Here's just some scenes from our little world. I don't wanna go on too long about any of this. But then the question you may be asking at this point is, but is it humanities? Well, of course it is, because what we're bringing to bear as humanists, if I can still claim that term, is are things like close reading of individual texts and of built and curated collections of materials, which might include archives, cities, landscapes, sonnets, and ruins, by inevitably interested parties. We bring to the table a critical skepticism. I started with suspicion and I changed it to skepticism. Critical skepticism about all narratives, data sources, and positivistic statements of fact. We bring the ability to limb, project, and articulate alternative interpretive structures and argumentative frameworks. We bring signs and meaning making in human contexts, social, political, and cultural effects. We bring our analysis and understanding of media affordances and rhetorics as, the, as we choose them as a mode of expression. And we also bring in the uh, ability to deal with humanity's data quote unquote, in all its partial, eclectic, inconsistent, contradictory, multimodal, messy, maddening, exhilarating glory, and an awareness that all data is ultimately humanity's data. And that's all I have to say about that for now. Thank you. I want to just uh, offer a shameless plug before I get started <laughs> for another IHUM collaboration, which is somehow, you know, I managed to stay in touch with Tomas over the years, and um, <laughs> we co-edited this book called Film and Genocide, and Jenny Barker has an essay in it. It's coming out soon, and I'm horrified by the cover that is being displayed over here. It's Don Cheadle with a gun to his head. Um, that was designed by the press, one of these situations where we absolutely hated it, and uh, we were so horrified by it, although it is from the movie Hotel Rwanda, not really indicative in any way of genocide though. Um, so we registered our disapproval and they are changing the cover, which we're very happy about. So that won't be the cover. 
Anyway, um, Tomas and I are kind of sharing our topic, so I'll try to be brief and give you a little bit of context about the university where we work right now. It's down in Southern California. It's called SOCA, S-O-K-A, University of America. And this is probably the world's tiniest liberal arts college. We have 500 students total. Um, the university is only 10 years old, and it's uh, very committed to the idea of student-centered, interdisciplinary, whatever that means, now I'm wondering, uh, education. It's also based on um, the educational philosophy of a 19th century educator named Tsunesaburo Makiguchi from Japan who wrote a book called Human Geography. Uh, he was also a Buddhist um, and uh, the president of a pretty large Buddhist organization at the time. Um, his educational theories uh, are often discussed um, in combination with those of John Dewey. They shared a lot of ideas about student-centered experimental education, um, but he also combined certain Buddhist concepts in his theories like um, interconnectivity, empathy, and interdisciplinarity. Um, and I guess at the time, you know, in 19th century Japan, uh, he probably didn't use the term interdisciplinarity, but um, bringing the humanities in particular to bear and the arts on um, his particular field, which was education and geography. So uh, I also just wanted to say that I think my IHUM experience not only gave me invaluable pedagogical and mentoring experience, but conceptually positioned me well for my current position at Soka University um, and continues to inspire my teaching and inform it. Because uh, even though we're a really small liberal arts college, we don't have a lot of faculty to faculty discussions about pedagogy. Um, we often, our time spent in the faculty forum meetings uh, usually revolves around just details of you know, whatever business we're dealing with. So I really appreciate the meaningful pedagogical exchanges we had in IHUM. Okay, so part of our university's mission is to foster, and I'm quoting from the statement, a steady stream of global citizens committed to living a contributive life. And then under the mission and values section you, uh, of our website, it reads, quote, classrooms are centers or dia of dialogue and discussion. And SUA is founded on the belief that student-centered education is the best way to promote peace and human rights by fostering a global humanistic perspective on the world in which we live. Now, a lot of universities share, have similar values in their mission statements. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, Soka University has gone to pretty great lengths to uphold this mission where the student classroom experience is concerned. And some of the setup of all of the classes is sort of like um, the IHUM classes. All of our classes are capped at 15 students. So they really want us as professors to have a close experience with our students. 40% of the student population is from, uh, are, are from out, other countries outside of the United States. Um, free tuition is offered to any qualified app applicant from the United States or not whose family earns under $60,000 per year. So our foreign students who arrive at SUA um, come from a variety of class backgrounds for the most part, which is nice. And all students are required to take a semester of study abroad courses. And then we also have summer and, uh, and year-long bridge uh, programs to help students whose language um, reading skills aren't up to par in English get where they need to be. So um, in addition to uh, the bulk Oh, in addition to this, the bulk of the student courses are required courses that challenge students to think um, from interdisciplinary perspectives and also challenge the faculty members to teach from interdisciplinary perspectives. So again, going back to fall IHUM, you've got, I mean, people just teaching all kinds of stuff because we have a lot of required courses for the students and the entire faculty are required to sort of help out with those. Um, and we, had, we only have one major, liberal arts, but we have four concentrations, environmental studies, humanities, social and behavioral science, sciences, and international studies. And I am the director of the writing program, but I'm also an affiliate professor in humanities. And the writing program is designed to intersect with all of the concentrations. So all students take 
an introductory writing course and an advanced one. And the advanced one is sort of pegged thematically with one of the concentrations. Um, so again, you know, the IHOM program's design of interdisciplinary lectures, small discussions, really helped me to be ready for this kind of uh, institutional setting. Um, and then, so the, finally, as, as seniors, the students are hopefully ready by the time they've um, taken all of the courses and gone on mandatory study abroad, whether they like it or not, um, and uh, learned a new language that isn't one that they came in somewhat familiar with. They're not actually allowed to use a language they already know as their foreign language. They have to try a different one. Um, and after they've self-designed their own learning cluster courses, many, that's what Tomas is going to talk about. And many of those courses actually take place in other countries. After they've done all that, they're expected to design their own um, capstone senior thesis writing project, which is a semester-long project that they work on closely with the faculty mentor. And in most cases, those are pretty interdisciplinary, uh, I, would, I would say. Um, so one of the things that we uh, struggle with, I think, at our university um, is, well, we, do get, we don't get that many students saying, why do I have to take this course? I'd rather be taking a course in my discipline, because you know, all of the students are sort of sharing a discipline. Um, but we do have arguments about curriculum, uh, uh, long discussions about this thing called assessment, which you know just hovers over us like a dark cloud. Um, but we're all trying to find ways to actually um, create assessment models that will work for our institution. And one of the things that I've done um, as director of the writing program is completely changed the type of assessment we're doing. Uh, students came in, before I was director, they all had to come in as freshmen and take a mandatory, uh, hellish, on-the-spot writing exam. It's kind of like a, you know, <laughs> something that you would do you know, in the SR SATs or GRE uh, exam. And this was really difficult because they would be given a prompt that was usually about something very United States-centric. Um, that many of the, the students coming in really wouldn't even know the basic vocabulary for because it didn't pertain to their political scene at all. Um, so I noticed that right away the first time that I offered the exam and decided that if I did anything as director, it would be to change that. So we have moved to a portfolio model of assessment, which has been really nice where students can select the, the paper that they would like to discuss and they have one-on-one -on -one hour-long meetings with a writing specialist in the writing center <coughs> where they talk about things like, you know, their incoming goals for developing as a writer, their connection to the university's mission, what they'd like to explore in their writing, you know, over the next few years, et cetera. So that's been really rewarding and nice um, for me. And um, I just really quickly wanted to talk about some of the challenges. Um, not only do we have challenges in terms of um, how do we assess an entire institution that is interdisciplinary um, because sometimes the outside rubrics from rubricstar.com or whatever it is that, you know where you can find these, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of times they don't really apply or they need to be modified or you know, something like that. Um, I know you guys are all writing down that, rubicstar.com or whatever it is. Um, and also, one of the things we come up against is just the real difficulty of upholding the university's mission. Um, there are, there's a range of professors. Some are really excited about teaching in this interdisciplinary way. Some feel a little bit put out. And um, I wonder if, you know, they might rather work at a research one institution um, or try to bring in that, uh, emphasize the disciplinarity a little bit more. Um, and when that does happen, there are pros and cons. Um, sometimes they end up speaking to a very small percentage of students that are interested in their area, leaving out the rest. So we have those types of conflicts. Um, we also have a lot of discussions on the admissions committee, you know, about what is the student profile that we're looking for. If we want to change into the future, how do we want to change? Do we want to 
grow in this way where we begin to look like any other university because frankly sometimes it is difficult to get some of the top students when they when they might want to go to a, a university where they can very clearly identify themselves in a disciplinary track because they often think that's going to lead to more career possibilities and money. So I've had discussions with some prospective students about these types of issues. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, we constantly are almost approaching this, I, this topic of a general overhaul of the entire, you know, <laughs> um, general education curriculum, which is, I would say, 90% of what the students will take at the university. And I do think that we're getting closer and closer to, to having this discussion. And once we begin to have that discussion, I know exactly where it's going to go. It's going to go into this sort of area of, well, why this course, not that? And what it ultimate, ultimately boils down to is that every camp wants students you know, in their camp. They want to be able to teach their classes. And unfortunately, that those wants and desires manifest as, you know, my area is more important and crucial than yours, and here's why. And, and so that's unfortunate. It doesn't always go in that direction, but these are just some of the, the challenges, I think, that as faculty members we face. So I think my presentation has been a little bit more uh, in the area of faculty and administration, um, because that's kind of where I'm at right now. I just... Uh, only have one more year as director, and then I <laughs> go back to being a professor, and I'm really excited about that. I can't wait. Um, but uh, I've learned a lot, and it's been very interesting. And I've learned that even though I have landed in an institution that I think is perfect for my background, which is kind of all over the place, um, <clears throat> maintaining a real commitment to interdisciplinarity on an institutional level is really difficult. And we're always being threatened by the, the possibility that we might not be able to do that or we might have to shift into uh, something else. So anyway, at this point, I'll turn it over to Tomas, who will keep talking about our institution, but in a different way. Thanks. That's really short. <clears throat> so, hello. I'm Tomas. Um, uh, one thing that I was um, really attracted uh, when we well, Christy got a tenure track position and we negotiated a visiting professorship for me, for myself, was the core values of the university. And um, Christy was talking about this idea of interdisciplinarity and uh, Andrew also addressed those issues. Um, and I tend to always try to go back to those core values. For me, the core values that I identify in the university are um, um, human rights. You know? And um, I've been doing research on human rights for probably the, the last 10 years, focusing on documentary film and the relationship of documentary film to crimes against humanity and the prosecutions of crimes uh, against humanity. So whenever there's a cultural war in my university, I always try to focus on, well, what is the core value of the university? And in discussions with other professors or the students, I will go back to square one. You know. What are the core values of the university? What is the mission of the university? Well, preserving human rights. I say, well, that, that's what you're here for. You know? Forget about all the other crap. Focus on that. No? This is what we're here for. No? So that's really been very helpful to me in the last um, uh, three years. And I was just recently reading um, a recent book by Martha Nussbaum called Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. And I think she's also thinking about that in this really, I think, critical time uh, we're living uh, right now, not only in the United States, but also in Europe, and also in Latin America. I'm from Argentina, and we spent about three months. I beg for five months. Sometimes we go for five months out of the year. And I have a lot of colleagues that teach in universities there. And we have a lot of conversations about education, of course. And they know that I taught at Stanford. And teaching at Stanford is like playing for Barcelona, if you like soccer. <laughs> so we talk about that a lot, no? And it's very hard to, to have a dialogue no, about education when they know that you know, the budget of Stanford probably is the budget of uh, health, public works, education of the whole country, no? So, but what is interesting is that we both, we can meet with my colleagues in the discussion and in the core values. Now, what are the core values of education? 
And this last year has been incredibly interesting to me because there's, um, I don't know if you've been following the, the protests in Chile, no? Um, and I've been very excited about what's happening in Chile because the trials against crimes of humanity in Chile have been uh, less than nothing. And uh, Argentina has done a lot, of, a lot of progress recently. So at the same time that this was happening in Chile and we're having discussions with my colleague about the situation in Chile, I'm also attending the trials for crimes against humanity and I'm thinking about you know, what has happened in Argentina in the last 30 and 40 years. And all these discussions ended up in, well, what are we here for? What are we teaching? What are the core values? And um, so it seems to me that the, the cultural war in Latin America is the privatization of education and education being s still uh, free and open to everyone. And um, it's one of the things that uh, makes me proud about my country is that we still have free education for, for everybody, for the university level, no? I don't know what the retention rates are, but just knowing that people can attend a university for free, I think encourages a type of dialogue about education that is very enriching. And I've been to classes, undergrad classes and graduate courses um, in the social sciences, although I'm not a social scientist, and I see the difference no, in the type of dialogue between the professors and the students. The dialogue is not centered on the discipline per se, but it's centered on the issues that are being discussed in the course. And that I think is so important. And I'm afraid somehow that we're losing track of that in the United States, although I'm not considering myself to be an American. I'm always call myself an Argentinian, no matter how many years I spend in this country. But uh, um, so I think that there has been some discussions about that here today, you know, about discipline, interdisciplinary, departments, and stuff like that. And I think that we do have a meeting point for these types of discussions. And I think those, that meeting point is what are we here for? Are we trying to teach um, a model of good citizenship to our students, like Martha Nussbaum such, suggesting in her book? So um, can we have a discussion about what that means today? No? I think that's really, really important. And um, the, perhaps the best experience I've had in SOC, and I, I'm going to end with this, because it would be nice for all of us to have a discussion, is uh, something we call a learning cluster. Learning Cluster is um, a course that uh, professors can teach outside of the country. So um, it's a lot of work. Um, I, um, I've taught this course twice. One was in, um, in Brazil. We studied uh, Japanese immigration to Brazil. A lot, of, a lot of our students are from Japan. So they were in, very interested to compare the um, immigration experience of Japanese in Brazil um, in, in, compared to the one in the United States. So I took my students to Sao Paulo and we spent there 10 days and we researched the, the, that topic. The second learning cluster was in Tijuana, Mexico. And we uh, went to, to Tijuana and interviewed documentary filmmakers that have been sort of following the developments in, in the border crossings and the disappearance of women and the situation of little children that are traveling from the south of Mexico to go into the United States by themselves and sometimes don't, can't find their parents in the United States after they cross illegally. So that was the second project. Now the third project that I'm doing is on rights of children, which is a topic that I'm super excited and I propose it to a group of students and then the students help me shape the curriculum. So the, the topic is right of children in Argentina and then the students will um, tell me what aspect of that topic they are interested in. My interest is in the appropriation of children during the dictatorship in Argentina. Children were taken away from people that were in concentration camps and were given to military family. And through DNA testing, the identity of those, ch those children have been, what they call in Argentina, recovered. And uh, grown women and men that are around 30 years old have discovered that their true identity was being born to parents of uh, militants of political parties. Uh, one of them is the youngest member of Congress, was elected uh, a few years ago. And uh, one of them ran for, for, for office uh, this year where I was there. So all these people are kind of recovering their political identity and, and becoming really instrumental in what's going on in Argentina. So that's what we're going to be studying in the next learning cluster project. 
So just to end, I think that what's amazing about this opportunity to travel abroad is that we have the capital uh, from the support of our administration saying this is a good thing, please do it, we'll pay you, we'll pay the students to go there, which is of course amazing. But it also boils down to money and, and, and uh, support of the administration. No? And the administration identifies with the core values of the university, and that's why the money is there. So if we identify with the core values and we can have a discussion what those core values are, maybe the humanities can recover some of, the, of that money, you know, that capital. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the whole, maybe the whole theme that we share you know, um, about Soka University in particular is that you can't have a whole institution committed to um, interdisciplinarity or multi-perspectives or humanistic globalism or whatever you want to call it without that uh, real commitment on all levels institutionally to supporting those types of classes and making them happen. And that's the very thing that sometimes I worry little by little mm -hmm. might be chipped away at without real vigilance and constantly coming back to <clears throat> what is it about you know, the mission of this university that makes it unique and will continue to enable it to be its own thing and not become, you know, just another uh, small liberal arts college. <clears throat> so, not that they're not great, too. It's just mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> that didn't sound right. Anyway. So, thank you.